Hello and welcome to The Easel Studio, your weekly hepatology broadcast news. In today's episode, we're going to talk about primary sclerosis and cholangitis, PSC, and overlap presentations with autoimmune hepatitis. Does overlap syndrome really exist? And are there differences between children and adults? What is autoimmune sclerosis and cholangitis? And should we try to redefine how we talk about these conditions? So I'm joined today by colleagues and friends who are each you know, key opinion leaders in the field. Uh, first of all, Amanda Ricutio uh, from Canada, who sort of um, has a specific interest in inflammatory bowel disease and how that influences um, the development and progression of, of primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Professor Christoph Schramm, who leads the International PSC Study Group from, the, um, from Hamburg. And Marianne Salmon, who is a colleague from down the road from where I am, down in King's College Hospital, London, who's got an interest in paediatric autoimmune liver disease. So to start off with, let me um, uh, sort of uh, start the uh, discussion, perhaps Amanda, if I uh, lead with you. So in uh, when it comes to uh, autoimmune liver disease presentations in children, can you just tell me what does PSC look like and what does autoimmune hepatitis and ASC look like from your lens? Sure. And I'd just like to apologize for the quality of my voice as I'm fighting a bit of a virus. Um, but when it comes to PSC specifically, I think in the pediatric setting, we're used to frequently seeing children presenting with a bit more of an inflammatory phenotype. Um, certainly, studies have shown higher rates of PSC with AIH overlap. And I mean, we'll get into what that term really means and if it actually is a distinct entity. But studies have suggested rates of PSC with AIH features of about a third in pediatric studies compared to about 10% in adult studies. Now, these studies used different criteria, which in and of itself is an issue. But I think it does jive with what we see clinically. We frequently see pediatric PSC patients present with high liver enzymes, ALT, AST, high IgG, um, frequently positive autoantibodies, um, as well as sometimes features that are AIH-like on biopsies, such as interface hepatitis. Um, so I, I think that's a characteristic of pediatric PSC, that it tends to be um, more inflammatory compared to adult PSC. And I mean, uh, to, to Marianne then, so I mean, you know, the nomenclature or the, the nosology of autoimmune sclerosis and cholangitis was really grown out of the, you know, the King's group sort of many years ago. Um, you know, just following on from what Amanda described, you know, what, what does what what is autoimmune sclerosis and cholangitis and, and what does that look like um, from the pediatrician's eye? Um, yes, yeah, so, sorry, Patrick, I, I apologize in advance if there's some kind of poor um, poor communication or you don't hear me properly. Uh, but but I think we have always kind of taken the stance of really looking for sclerosis and cholangitis in patients presenting with autoimmune um, liver disease, which kind of entailed making sure a cholangiography was done and also have a very low threshold um, to do a liver biopsy, which I think is a bit different from, from the adult setting. So I think we probably have been looking for it more. Um, and similarly, we're also, I think, for IBD as well. Um, so I don't know whether that kind of correlates with the higher prevalence that we, we have seen and also applying the pediatric criteria for autoimmune liver disease rather than the adults with regards to the, the kind of um, lower threshold of positive autoantibodies um, compared to kind of what's in the, in the adult kind of diagnostic criteria. Um, so I think those are, are kind of probably the most different. I think that one of the biggest issues with this topic is, is that there is not really good data um, and the data that's available is kind of been collected with different thresholds and different kind of diagnostic criteria. So that makes it really tricky to kind of have a good picture of what this condition really is. Um, and then also, of course, what we're going to talk about later, how it evolves. So that's an, you raised an interesting point right at the beginning. You said that in every patient with autoimmune hepatitis that you see in in childhood, you would look for um, features of a sclerosis and cholangiopathy, and you would image them. Now, so just just following on from that, I mean, would you look for the presence of inflammatory bowel disease in all patients who have autoimmune or children who have autoimmune hepatitis, not the PSE group, but with but in people who have got autoimmune hepatitis? 
and have got cholangiographic features as well, would you look for inflammatory bowel disease in all of those patients? And how would you do that in children? Yeah, most definitely, and I, I do think what's what's been a big a big change is the 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 um, the, um, the facilities to do fecal cal protecting because previously um, when we started kind of looking into this CP and they would have a um, a flexible kind of sigmoidoscopy rectoscopy done at the same general anesthesia, but that's kind of many many years ago. So now we do use a fecal cal protecting and also so make sure that in the history taking we do ask for um, these kind of symptoms um, but I think what is really relevant is even if the fecal cow protecting would be negative or kind of even only mildly elevated we would still kind of and probably Amanda would be the best person to kind of elaborate on that um, but so to explore further have a low threshold to look for it and the other thing is, I think, keep on asking the questions about IBD during the follow up, because it's not because it's not there at diagnosis that it doesn't kind of um, develop later. And I think that's the same kind of vice versa in the IBD patients kind of looking for the liver disease as well as time goes on. Well, that's very important. So I think, Amanda, just to sort of so do you wanted to add, so add to what Marianne was uh, saying? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, um, firstly, I just wanted to comment on, you know, the concept of a patient with AIH who then, you know, undergoes cholangiography and has abnormalities there. Like that to me is a patient with PSC who has more of an inflammatory phenotype. That's how that's how I view it. Um, but I certainly agree that any patient with PSC or cholangiographic abnormalities should have a colonoscopy to screen for IBD. Even in the absence of symptoms, I think PSC IBD is notorious for not manifesting very many IBD symptoms. Um, we've shown that in our pediatric cohort, and it's been shown elsewhere. That may relate to the fact that the inflammation tends to be worse in the right colon, and so it doesn't result in as many overt symptoms. So I don't think we can rely on symptoms. Fecal calprotectin is definitely a better screening test, but it's you know it's it's imperfect. The lower you set your threshold, for sure, the better, the more sensitive it will be and the more confident you can be. But nevertheless, you know, it's still imperfect. And I think the stakes are so high in terms of possibly missing IBD in a PSC patient. The, the rates of concomitant IBD are so high that I would also be in favor of a screening colonoscopy in every PSC patient, even the pediatric patient. And if that colonoscopy is normal, then, you know, keeping an open mind about development of symptoms, screening with fecal calprotectin. I'm probably undertaking another colonoscopy a few years down the road, even if everything seems okay. And I mean, just before I ask Christoph a question, the next question, I mean, Marianne, you you said you said uh, you, you uh, or Amanda and Amanda, you both sort of mentioned about a third of patients with autoimmune hepatitis in, in childhood will have some of these, you know, um, cholangiographic features. And Amanda, you you allude to the fact that. That these will sort of subsequently sort of evolve, or this is just an inflammatory PSC type phenotype. Can you just talk just a little bit about if you've got a patient with autoimmune hepatitis and you can't see any biliary features histologically or cholangiographically, but that patient does have inflammatory bowel disease. So an AIH patient in childhood who who develops inflammatory bowel disease as they grow older. So what what would you class that individual as and how readily would you or how frequently would you then screen them for a cholangiopathy? I'll ask that to Amanda first, I think. Um, yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, we do know that there is also a certain proportion of patients with AIH who have concomitant IBD. It's not as high as the um, coexistence uh, in the setting of PSC. Um, so I think we do have to keep an open mind for evolution towards you know, PSE manifesting itself. Um, I would probably monitor with uh, regular liver enzymes. And if I saw something funny happening with GGT, undertake a, a cholangiography. I don't know that I would necessarily routinely get a cholangiography, an MRCP, if the enzymes were completely normal throughout. Okay. So, so that, that so let's transition slightly. So, so we've got we've got children with um, autoimmune liver disease. They are coming of age, as they say, and they transition to adult practice and see individuals like Christoph and myself as um, adult hepatologists. 
I mean, a key question is, you know, is the clinical course difference between, you know, P a classical PSE, PSE with overlapping features of AIH, that's the sort of, you know, first bit of dialogue. And importantly, you know, which of these patients would benefit from immunosuppression? Christoph, what's your view? Yeah, I think that's that's a, a question that is uh, difficult to answer because it depends on the treatment um, we give our patients. I'm quite um, convinced that um, if you have a high inflammatory activity and you don't add immunosuppression to the treatment regimen, that disease cause will be worse. Um, however, in uh, patients with an inflammatory PSC who receive adequate immunosuppressive treatment, similar to AIH treatment, I'm not sure whether disease cause really differs that much from classical PSC. I think we we are, have a clear lack of good and prospective data on that, and um, we already discussed some of the differences between pediatric and adult care. And honestly, I think in adults, even in young adults, we don't have enough information because we um, infrequently perform liver biopsies, and some, sometimes we perform a liver biopsy uh, in a patient with high transaminases, and then it turns out it's all called a static hepatocyte damage, and there's no um, uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate whatsoever. So I think uh, this is a, it's a huge challenge, I think, in clinical practice, and, um, and we clearly need more data on that. And so, so you're emphasizing the importance of liver biopsy, which I think most of us will echo here, and uh, to, to identify which people are likely to benefit from immunosuppression rather than just relying on the liver enzymes. And if I add in just, you know, the IgG values, for example, I mean, these can be elevated for a number of reasons. What's, do you have a particular threshold beyond which you say, actually, I do not, whilst this person may have moderate interface hepatitis, they may not benefit from immunosuppression. I mean, sort of, um, do you have any, in your own practice, you know, evidence is lacking, we appreciate that. Yeah, I think I think liver biopsy is a prerequisite here. Um, I think uh, based solely on, on liver transaminases and IgG, it's very difficult to decide. Um, we need a liver biopsy. And then uh, I think um, if you have at least a moderate um, hepatitis activity on biopsy, I think you should give it a try uh, of immunosuppressive treatment. There's no generally agreed um, cutoff for a modified hepatitis activity index, for example, that could guide that uh, decision. I think it, it remains highly individualized. Okay, and um, um, Marianne and Amanda, did, you, did either of you want to sort of add to what Christoph was saying about people who would benefit versus not benefit from corticosteroids or immunosuppression, should I say, not corticosteroids? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really hard. I think we don't have good guidance at all to inform that question. Um, I think, you know, there's certainly not good, I think that there's not good data at present that treating such patients with immune suppression alters outcomes like progression to liver transplant. Nevertheless, we, you know, we also do it because we also don't have high quality evidence clearly disproving that it's helpful. So un until we have clear evidence on the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of immune suppression in these patients. It's still something that we do. Um, as has been mentioned, we don't have good criteria for, you know, when exactly to initiate it, but I agree. I think liver biopsy is an important part of it. Um, and that's part of the issue is that we're not standardized in terms of, you know, how we decide which patients warrant immune suppression. And that makes it really hard to study um, in terms of whether it's effective or not. But I think it's really interesting to look at the two largest studies on this question of comparing outcomes between, you know, classic PSC and PSC with AIH overlap. The data from the International PSC Study Group on the adult side showed similar outcomes in terms of progressing to liver transplant or death between PSC and PSC AIH. Um, and presumably, I mean, we don't know for a fact, we, we didn't have that data, but presumably the patients with AIH features were treated. And similarly, in the pediatric PSC consor consortium from Mark Deneau's group, again, their um, patients with AIH overlap had similar outcomes to patients with PSC without AIH overlap. Um, so I think we definitely need, these were both retrospective studies, we definitely need better quality prospective studies to definitively answer that question, uh, because it is a very important question. And I think it's difficult I... when you've got to pay, sorry, go on. 
Go on, Christoph. Well, I think regarding treatment uh, with all the new biologicals uh, we have, good old azathioprine still has a role in those patients, especially in, in, in active IBD. So it will act on the liver and the gut uh, at the same time. Yeah. It's easier when the IBD is active because you don't I, need to give I, immunosuppression. <laughs> oh, I think Marianne was going to but, but that, say something. I, that is the confusing, can be the confusing. Sorry, I think that oh, can sorry. be the confusing element to it because we have somebody diagnosed and treated for IBD. Sorry, Mary, I think, Mary, I think you're sort of uh, you're cutting out intermittently. Sorry, do you want to repeat that again? Yeah, sorry. Um, I think what can be confusing as well is that patients that come to us with already existing IBD and non-treatment that might also mask probably some of yes. the biopsy features or kind of the pattern. So we're not kind of treating all these patients in a in a same way. Um, we did find that early treatment of, of um, early looking for PSC and IBD patients um, actually did make a difference um, because they were, were treated for IBD kind of really quickly and their treatment, uh, as Christoph was suggesting with, for example, azathioprine was continued. Um, and we all have had patients where when we speak to the pathologist and we ask them to look back at the original um, histology, it was a clear picture of an autoimmune hepatitis, but by the time the patient comes for transplant, the histology is really a, a, a typical page, a feature of, of PSC with no um, autoimmune features present. Yeah. So we might partially treat that aspect of it. Yeah, and I mean it's it's very difficult when you've got a young person, and I think the term young here is 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 very important because one in three people with autoimmune hepatitis in childhood will have some features of a cholangiopathy, and and age of the spectrum doesn't automatically mean that as soon as they hit sixteen or eighteen or wherever the transition happens to adult practice that that's going to drop. You know that's good. so certainly young adults would fall into a similar bracket even if the frequency starts to, to starts to dip a little. So it's very difficult when you've got a young person who's got very active um, hepatitic uh, features on biopsy to not give immunosuppression when they have transaminases in the several hundreds and an elevated bilirubin value. It becomes difficult and. I complete. I I acknowledge all the data from the international PSC study group and have been involved in some of that and the pediatric consortium. What we don't know though is if the PSC AIH overlapping featured patients were not given immunosuppression, would their survival have been dwarfed? You know, sort of, would that have fallen? And I suppose, I mean, my next question to Christoph on that topic is, you know, you mentioned that you firmly believe that the people with very active hepatitis. Um, seen on a biopsy who have PSC um, benefit from immunosuppression, but there's going to be a difference here between acute short-term immunosuppression to, to treat a flare um, versus long-term immunosuppression as the disease evolves and, you know, these wads of concrete around, you know, bile ducts over to sort of take over. So if somebody has responded to immunosuppression biochemically and their IgG values have fallen, at what point would you think about peeling back their immunosuppression or weaning off them, I and mean, that's a, even perhaps an even difficult decision. It's difficult to turn an oil tanker around once you've already committed to, to immunosuppression. Yeah. So one of the um, one of the caveats is that we may increase the risk for malignancy uh, under long term immunosuppression. We have looked into those um, uh, data <clears throat> or azathioprine uh, treatment, and we don't see an increase in cholangiocarcinoma risk under azathioprine. So I think. On the, on the contrary, I mean, there's some indication from the literature that uh, azathioprine may even lower the risk of CCA development, and that may relate to CCA being an inflam inflammation-induced cancer. So I think it's a very difficult question you are asking. Um, I usually um, try to withdraw immunosuppression in a patient that has well responded after three to four years, depending on IBD activity, obviously. If the IBD activity is not completely suppressed, I tend to leave a rather low dose of azathioprine in, um, even long-term. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, 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 that's a 
similar to, to, to what we would do here. One of the bigger challenges, though, is to try and stop colleagues from giving elephantine doses of corticosteroids to try and suppress activity. So it's I think I think trying to peel back steroids um, is a more difficult task. As a thiaprin, there's a bit more justification for other reasons as well. But I think trying to not give people lots of doses of corticosteroids because once upon a time they had autoimmune hepatitis, but now their disease has evolved or grown up as the person has become older. I think I don't know if Amanda, you wanted to sort of comment on that. I don't know how uh, sort of as a pediatrician, as a pediatrician who sees IBD and uh, liver disease, sort of what's your view? I mean, is there any any tactics you can give us to stop colleagues giving lots of uh, corticosteroids when, when uh, uh, through fertility? Um, I mean, I think one of the challenges in this setting is, you know, interpreting liver enzymes after starting immune suppression in a patient with PESC and AIH features, because I don't think we can necessarily apply the same endpoints or the same definition for remission that we would in AIH. You know, liver enzymes may remain abnormal because of the PSC. So we, we certainly often find ourselves in that situation um, where things have not completely normalized, but we're not entirely sure what's driving it. And so we'll often undertake a repeat biopsy and see if that initial hepatitis activity, you know, has decreased or has gone away. And if that's the case, then we won't continue kind of flogging the horse with increased immune suppression. Um, so that's one potential approach. I mean, we, we certainly try to not use high dose steroids for too long. So we do use them in the short term at the beginning, but we would then try to wean that down quite quickly. And if we needed to keep something on board, it might be a low dose of prednisone or azathioprine, as you've mentioned. I mean, so so let me play devil's advocate here then. So if you've got somebody who's been on, say, 30 milligrams, to, or between 20 to 30 milligrams of prednisolone, this is a 16, 17 year old boy who, who's, you know, who weighs about 65 kilos and they're they're they've got persistently elevated ALT values despite being on that and azathioprine, so steroids and azathioprine. You repeat the biopsy and it still shows moderate hepatitis activity. Now, in my mind, that tells me that corticosteroids and azathioprine perhaps have not done anything. I mean, maybe they've held the fort a little, but in those people who still got a ongoing activity, I would argue that perhaps even in them you would want to withdraw corticosteroids at least, um, uh, because there's been no there's been no benefit. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a very good point. Um, you know, uh, trying a therapy and showing that it hasn't resulted in yeah. any benefit also, I think, should be an indication to consider withdrawing or decreasing it. Yeah. And not to pick on you because of your uh, your your carizal illness, but um, just in terms of uh, the medications that Christoph alluded to, these new biologics that we use. I mean, we started off with infliximab, adalimumab. We're now in an era of small molecules. You know, these you know upadacitinib, which has revolutionised you know oral IBD therapy. Um, I mean, can, can you just sort of just uh, talk me through what impact do these agents have on immunoglobulin profile, autoantibody profile? Because often when we refer to colleagues to our units, it's not because they've had histo you know, histology that indicates severe activity, but it's because their they're biochemistry and serotypes um, are indicative of an overlap with AAH. And there's been, a, there's been an impetus by, by others to, to give them immunosuppression. Um, and I'm not sure how these new drugs affect antibody levels in, in IgG. I guess the one that I'm most familiar with would be anti-TNF and, you know, the role that it can play in terms of ANA positivity. Like there is literature documenting that anti-TNF is associated with a certain rate of ANA positivity. And there are also some TNF associated, you know, AIH in, in quotations where it seems to be related to the medication on biopsy. It looks like AIH, but you withdraw the anti-TNF and, and it goes away. Um, so I think that that's important to consider. Um, I'm, I'm not particularly aware of any data regarding any of the other biologics and small molecules and um, impact on autoantibodies. I mean, certainly IBD in and of itself can be associated with raised IgG, not usually to the degrees that you would see in AIH, but sort of mild to moderate increases, um, as well as a certain rate of ANA positivity. So all of that really kind of muddies the picture and makes it um, even more difficult to interpret. And I mean, I mean, just uh, just on 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 that that topic. I mean, Christoph, did you want to sort of come in here and just talk a little bit about sort of your experience with using biologics in patients with sort of you know uh, uh, PSC, IBD, and 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 if you've got any experience, particularly in the group of patients with overlap features with AAH? 
So hopes were high after we started to use vedolizumab, right? And uh, quite disappointing to see that not much happens uh, in the liver. Um, and the same holds true, unfortunately, for the other biologics um, we analyzed so far. But data is very sparse. Um, we have, as you mentioned, quite good experience now with the selective JAK1 inhibitors. Um, I, I have some faint hope that it may also benefit the uh, PSC, um, but uh, we have to collect data on that, and we, we just started to do that. And um, I think um, at least I think the good news is that these agents are quite safe in PSC patients, so we don't have a safety signal so far. Um, uh, but whether they are useful, uh, we'll, we'll have to wait for that. And do you, and just in, in do you, if you have any patients with AIH and IBD or any AIH PSC overlap patients with it, do you, do you see any impact on hepatitis activity or uh, positively or negatively? I, I cannot tell. I would love to know how an active AI <laughs> responds to a selective JAK1 inhibition. I don't know any data on that, and I don't know whether you uh, here have any experience with that. I don't. We don't either. I, I don't know if, if Marianne or Amanda in there. In, in, I know some of the IBD drugs take longer to get to children than they do to adults. Absolutely. We don't have a UPA decision yet for pediatrics in Canada. Okay. okay. And I mean, I suppose so that sort of just takes me to sort of uh, another thing just to sort of finish off this easel studio, and that's, you know, around nomenclature. I mean, we've got we've got different terms for a disease that's already very heterogeneous in itself. So we've got classical PSC, we've got PSC with AAH overlap, so let's call that overlap syndrome for today, and we've got autoimmune sclerosing cholangitis. I mean, um, from, you know, first of all, to the two pediatricians on the call, do you do you see that there's a difference between PSC AAH overlap and autoimmune sclerosis and cholangitis? Let's just talk about those two for now. Do you sort of so Amanda? Do you think that those two are separate diseases or or, or the same thing? Yeah, um, I view them as the same thing. And uh, Marianne, what's what's your view? Sort of is overlap syndrome yeah. and, and ASC the same thing? I find it difficult that people get really stuck on the nomenclature and that kind of I think muddles the water even more I think it, it we really need to kind of agree that we're going to investigate these patients properly look for autoimmune liver disease look for IBD um, and look for kind of cholangiopathy so that we can kind of because that will be the only way we will see what the natural history is of, of these conditions particularly in those presenting in pediatrics and I think people get so fixated on the name that they then kind of sometimes lose the the I, I don't know I think don't see the yeah the wood for trees. I mean I, I completely agree I mean I think we've seen that these labels get applied based on completely definite completely different definitions and that's really unhelpful when it comes to trying to understand natural history so I think more important than label is just no careful characterization of, of phenotype, you know, or other cholangiographic abnormalities or more than, than a label that we apply because the labels are used so differently. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And I, um, I think the if we want to stick with a discussion about the nomenclature, I think the overlap term suggests that there are two separate diseases that sort of overlap. I think most of us would agree that it's a continuous spectrum of inflammatory activity in a cholestatic liver disease. This holds true probably for PSC and also for PBC. Um, and the, the important question here is who will benefit from treatment and how do we uh, diagnose these patients? Yeah, absolutely, good. Well, I think that sort of that, that wraps up our sort of our um, uh, rapid walkthrough of you know PSC AIH uh, and overlap syndromes. Is it is it a thing? I think that you know Christoph summarised very nicely that you know these are uh, in our opinion, at least to those on the panel, that um, you know this this condition, this syndrome is very much um, an inflammatory uh, part of the sort of uh, cholangiographic journey in in patients with uh, you know, with PSC, and we need to identify who's going to benefit, when they're going to benefit from immunosuppression, and, and and also, I'd add, you know, when to stop um, immunosuppression it, uh, it, when we see lack of, you know, response to it. So, um, 
thank you very much to my sort of uh, colleagues and friends for um, joining me this week, my panelists. Thank you to Easel for inviting us to present on this topic. And please join us next week for an episode which will explore the latest practice changing evolutions in liver cancer treatment. Remember to become a member and join the Easel family. Thank you very much. And I wish you a good evening. Or if you're watching this on demand, good morning and good afternoon. Bye bye.